Good day. I'm Mervyn Pearson. I'm going to take you through some information security policies, the importance, the design, and why we have it there, and what's the benefit of policies, and how long it's going to take, or how long it should take, and these issues. We're going to actually look at a quick objective, create a virtual organization so we understand when we develop it, look at the complexities of these organizations, can develop a plot, how we're going to do the frameworks, and, and look at that. We're going to develop some policies, look at that as an example, and then frameworks. Specific policies, key policies is a must. We'll look at that, for example, software security, the development in organizations. And I've got examples of different banks. One bank says uh, you have to use this. The other bank says you can use what you want, but with uh, certain limitations. Software development change control, data security, communication security in organizations, specifically remote access is important, and then physical security is one of our layers. And we also look at compliance monitoring versus enforcement of those policies, because the users have to know what they're signing, they have to show that they actually understand that, and you have to then lodge that signature against that policy for any future reference organizational policy statement from the top-down approach, policy rollout, how are you going to do that in an organization, and then also we need to understand the differences between policies, standards, procedures, and their maintenance. Now, a virtual company which we'll start off with is, let's call it XYZ. It's a multinational organization, so distributed over a couple of continents. We're looking at about 36,000 users with computer access, remote access specifically for Road Warriors or technical support has been enabled. It is a bank, uh, let's take three countries, England, South Africa, where the head office is located, and the Americas. Now, what you'll immediately understand when you look at is there might be some legal ramifications around different continents. Large complements of these users are contractors. It's a disparate environment with TCP IP as a communication protocol. Now, before we start, let's look at a quick differences. What are information system security policies? Before we have the policy, there are certain documentation that forms the support infrastructure for policies. We have a standard, and a standard is something we can measure usually. This is the what. The procedure is the how. How do we get there? It's a step-by-step -step process identifying an end result. And procedures often are used for disaster recovery planning, how to build a system and so on. A policy for me is a statement of intent. I usually call it, it's the company's or the enterprise law. However, it can never override actual law. Then we have a guideline, which is a nice to have. And then a baseline, if you haven't heard of that, baseline basically is the minimum security standard required when, for example, building a server, an exchange server, mail server, or a database server like a SQL server. Now, throughout this, I'll ask a couple of questions, and you have to sometimes just stop and take a step back and say, listen, what do we do in our organization? Are you aware of the policies in your organization? If not, ask a list, have a look at them, um, see which ones you have read already and you've agreed upon, if there's any contention. How often are they updated? Speak to the right people. Are you subjected to a resigning of that policy? For example, access to information or acceptable use. Now, there's processes which can make the, process, the, the whole acknowledgement fall down if you don't go through an acknowledgement at the end user. And we'll look at that. Now, why are policies important in an organization? Well, it's a measurement criteria. We can avoid liability. For example, if the one policy states that the end user is not allowed to put install software on the system, and they do do that, and then somebody comes and audits you, and they find that you've got illegally owned software, for example, copyright infringement. So if the user has signed the policy, you move that liability to the user and not to the organization. Implementation of controls, such as security controls. We've got consistent and adequate security, demonstrate management support, and also definitely a coordination between external and internal parties. That could be a supplier, it could be an auditor, uh, external auditor, or anything like that. Now also, when you consider your policies in your organization, what input does human resources need to have in policy development? This is important. Now see if they do, 
and if they don't, you'll see later where they have to be involved. Is your corporate internet server used to, as a portal for applicable policies? How do you or your organization communicate these policies to the end users? Are they freely available or should users go through a process to ask? And the third one here, are you aware of the consultation period in which all policies have to be vetted by the affected end users for acceptance or comment? And what this means, you cannot just write a policy, push it out and say, guys, new policy out there. You have to go through a consultation period where an end user or the user that will be affected by this policy have to look at that policy and all those users then look at that policy and they have to be able to comment and agree on this policy. If there's any contention, you have to handle it before you can actually roll it out. Now, policies can be a legal requirement. It also ensures corporate governance. Information classification can be handled because that's really important to have information classification defined as a policy or organization. You'll see if you don't have a security classification, I always say you don't have security because you don't know where to start. Encourage dynamic communication because if both parties read a policy, they'll actually speak the same type of language. Procurement is very important because most of the frauds taking place in organization can happen at procurement. We've seen that. Application development. Application development will tell you you can only use this type of language, this type of uh, project management technique, and, and, and it will actually enforce you to do this in organization. However, what I've seen in some of the banks Application development, it will say, for example, you will use Java or C Sharp depending on the platform you want to develop for. And another bank as well, quite, quite a, a leading bank worldwide actually has that you can use any language as long as we've got the source code and can be supported. And they want just to make sure that things get out very quickly. Now, can policy override common law? Definitely not because then the policy is null and void. If you did not sign a password policy during your employment process, can you be forced later to sign it? You cannot be forced. The problem here can be, an example, an organization will say, listen, uh, we realize that people are starting to share passwords and it's really becoming a problem. So they actually realize in the acceptable use policy that it, it's not covered. So what they do, update it and ask the users to re-sign it. If they haven't gone through the process of that consultation, you can as an end user feel that hey, if I don't sign this I might be a victim of possible um, you know trying to get rid of me so it can be defined as under duress a user can sign it make a note and say listen I was basically forced to sign that so you have to be very careful there now policies are beneficial to application development a lot of organizations need to understand this and it will cover things like who owns the source code, copyright infringements, and these kind of things. Now, also the last one here, does your organization have an information security classification policy? And if yes, how is this enforced? Have a look at that. And if you don't have one, it's really difficult for information security and business custodians to enforce security because where do you start? You don't, if you don't know what's secret, public or confidential, you don't know how to apply monetary value and, and, and controls on your security. Now the policy development process is really important. We need to look at key reference material. We'll see that what is outside, what is key reference material. That could be anything from previous hearings in your organization, things that went wrong, um, requirements in the bank. We can look at PCI or payment card industry standard. We can look at Basel, which is for risk management. And a couple of things that you have to pull together, also legal, local legal requirements. We should define a framework, how we start that, and I've got a very simple example we'll go through. Coverage matrix means that who will be covered by this policy. And you have to define, for example, remote access will only be applicable to users who does remote access into your organization. It will not be applicable to other users who don't. Critical systems definitions and decisions important not just for policy development but also for disaster recovery planning and business continuity planning. Process flow, here we will develop a policy, a policy will be reviewed, it will be approved and it will be enforced. The next step is anniversary wise, review, approve, enforce. So it will go through a cycle. Now name a few key reference material to gather before we initiate a policy development in an organization. Take a step back here, stop it if you want to, and actually look at a few documents that 
you know in your business, in your type of business. It could be, for example, uh, in the banking industry, in the insurance industry, and, and things like this. Now also consider the virtual company and what problems can you expect. Now the virtual company we've defined earlier, company XYZ, being a bank in different continents. If you look at the UK, they've got the Privacy Act of 1990. Um, I'm sorry, the Computer Misuse Act of 1990. In America, they've got the Privacy Act of 1972 or 73. And in South Africa, you've got the Electronic Communication and Transaction Act. Now, each one of these are different in point so that there can be contention on who's got access to what. Especially if you start looking at the Euro European Union, you have the Data Protection Act, which means no data of a user can go outside the EU without going through a... Uh, vetted process. Also, how long does it take and how long should it take to develop a policy? Sometimes when I look at organizations, the, the lack is normally that you don't have a single user that is in charge and drives this policy, like a project manager. So it can take quite a while. Now, my security policy framework before we look at that, we need to understand that policies define acceptable and appropriate behavior. And that is where our key, our first key policy will come in. It defines a foundation of tools and procedures that are required. That could be, for example, for uh, penetration testing in the organization. It could be for software development, etc. Policies communicate a consensus. We've seen that before. It's a foundation for human resources action during non-compliance. Also, policies assist in litigation. Now, when we look at trust models, there's basically three trust models we can actually look at. We can trust everybody all of the time, easiest to implement, but also very weak if there is a problem. We can trust no one all of the time, it's most restrictive and very totally not practical at all. And some people, some of the time, based on need to have access, detective controls that are required, so people will know they are being checked. Now, the problem is that if you trust everybody all of the time, then we can actually look at, you know, passwords. Do we require passwords then? And if we do passwords, do our passwords shared? Now also, what if does the organization policy define as an action for non-compliance with regards to your password policy? Can a user be fired for sharing his password? Is encryption covered by your policy? Now this is important because if it's a password and secret documentation, I've worked, walked into organizations and as you walk in, all the passwords are stuck to the side of the uh, server room so that you, you can log in. Now, the lack of trust drive policy development. Assignments of trust needs to be balanced, of course, and also policy infringement leads to policy refinement. This is the update process. Suddenly you realize I don't cover something in my policy and uh, for example you find that uh, some staff suddenly are most of the time sick on a friday or a monday and you might update your policy and say listen if you're sick on a friday or a monday have a doctor's note also you can also say trust no one but verify that issue the thing is can you trust management and sometimes yes i mean the the the, the, the one example i had is a lady who came to me and says, listen, my manager told me that I'm allowed to copy, and that is an illegal process, copyright infringement, movies and, 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 and music at work, however, don't get caught. And that's what he told her. Now, this is sometimes not the right thing you want from management. Your financial director, he's high up the tree there. You must make sure that he can be trusted. Now, also, try to think of some breakdown of breakdown in trust, some examples, possibly in your organization. The one I have here is that one administrator in organization was downloading movies uh, from the internet and copying them to DVDs and CDs for his friends for extra money on the side. Now, when policies are developed, you have to consider a couple of things who will be involved. We've got users, we've got technical users and administrators that know the system at a low level, management to give feedback, sometimes external customers if they have a service level agreement or SLA with us, business partners, also company lawyers and auditors to review all these policies that are designed to see if there's no contention to actual law. Now, with, in your organization, it all depends on the size of the organization. Make a list of people that should be involved with policy development in your organization. Ask questions about these. Can I enforce my policy on external customers and service providers? 
Answer is yes. It depends on your service level agreement, SLA, which we spoke uh, a slide ago. How often should users be made aware of current policies in the organization? This is part of your awareness process in your organization. One organization I had a look at, quite a large international organization, is that what they'll do is take a key policy, which is the acceptable use policy. That tells you what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. And what they do, they will email this policy every 90 days to all users in the organization that has access to email. And they'll publish it in the front always. Um, and they don't require the user to sign it again. However, what they do is part of the awareness process. They say, listen guys, just read it, make sure you understand what you're allowed to do, not. Now, when we design these policies, we have to look at and say, select a policy development team. So you've made a list of the users that you think that should be part of your de design team and select them. Should it be an entity or a committee that to interpret those policies? If it's an entity, it must be an experienced user, of course. Determine the scopes and goals of that policy, who's covered, and why are you doing this? The level of detail, do not name people. What that means is don't say uh, Joe Soap, for example, must be is responsible for this policy because Joe Soap might leave the organization later and then the policy has to change. You would rather define the head of IT or something like that. Also, consideration in a policy is an attribute that shouldn't change often. Uh, because if it does change, you have to change the policy and vet it again, go through the whole process. Then also the target audience, which will be affected, should review and comment. And this is usually your, what we said earlier, a consultation period. Support staff should be affected for review. Um, and support staff usually are your skilled staff. Awareness program is part of the introduction to the organization, also known as the induction process. And also policy training material, at least annually. People should be made aware and because you might have a problem one day and somebody does something and says, I didn't know that. And you can't prove that you've actually gone the extra mile from your side to make that people aware. Now, from a policy requirement, policies must be implementable and enforceable. Concise and easy to understand. The shorter, the better. Balance protection with productivity. Also, policies should state reasons why the policies are needed. Describe what is covered in those policies. Define contacts and responsibilities. And, very important, result for non-compliance. Okay, now from a couple of questions that you have to look at, take a step back in your organization again. Define any additional requirements you may have in taking your organization into consideration, depending on who you communicate with, who's your suppliers and so on. Using the virtual company, define any special requirements. Think about that. Give samples of action due to non-compliance. The one I actually like is failure to comply to this policy may lead to uh, charge, hearing, but ultimately you may be fired. Um, it must be clear in those words that users need to understand the results of non-compliance. Now also the level of control from a policy point of view, security requirement, Policies will define from a logical and physical security point of view. Culture of the organization plays a huge role. Now, in Africa to America to the UK to London, there are different cultures. And, you know, the policy might state one thing in one uh, culture and the other culture might interpret it totally incorrectly. So you need to have make sure it is balanced in the culture point of view, but also with productivity. If it's too strict, people will look for loopholes. Technical controls from a policy point of view are effective, but not always possible. And we see this often in fraud that you might have everything done, but collusion between people at the end of the day because of greed, fraud can still take place. Management commitment is crucial. Now, the questions here, I've got a statement where people are involved, we have failure of controls because people commit fraud, systems don't. You need to consider that. Have you done a business impact analysis in your organization? If you've done a formal risk analysis, well, what methodology did you use? Because when you define the critical systems definitions of the organization, you should have done a business impact analysis and also a risk analysis. But this ties really well into the BCP and DRP environment. So you can see you can actually do one and actually get the benefit in all three areas. Then, 
Finally, for this section, the policy structure, we need to look at a company's size and goals. Should we have one large document or many small ones? Small ones are definitely easier to update. However, you have the issue that you might have to refer to other policies and you have to be really careful of that. You can get generic policies and also specific policies, depending on if it's a government environment, military environment, you might have specific policies that are dedicated to that environment. And key policies is a must. So after this, take a step back, review this, and we're going to quickly review some key policies in the organization, what you need to do. Let's look at a couple of key policies. For example, the first key policy I'd like to stress, if you don't have any policies, is to develop an acceptable use policy. An acceptable use policy will define what users are allowed to do and not to do. Also, access to information, what the users are allowed to access and the need to have bases because you need to be able to, if a user gains access to information you should not have access to, for example, the salary, payroll, or so on, you need to be able to take action on that. Electronic communication policy, really important because it will cover things like email usage, internet access, instant messaging. Information classification, this will define for the custodians what they have to use to identify critical and secret information and what type of security control has to be put in place. A password policy, because this is my first logical control. Remote access, really important because that hopefully will define if a user comes in remotely, there will be additional monitoring and access control. A risk assessment, how to perform risk assessments in the organization. Now the next couple, the next four year for me, laptop security, demilitarized zone, host security, lab security are really important because critical data may be defined and located on each one of those devices. Antivirus, what you're allowed to use in the organization. Also, it will tell you if you want to connect to my organization, you have to have antivirus software. Virtual private networking, VPN, the way we get into the organization, if it is a virtual private network, or how the network should be segmented to make sure that my high-risk users see the different segment to my normal end users. Then also define a list of key policies which need to be taken in consideration when performing a fast-track exercise in your organization. You've seen those key policies, see which you have in your organization and which you don't have in your organization and what you need to do that. Now let a little bit more in detail, let's look at the acceptable use policy. It defines acceptable usage of computing resources in your organization. Users should acknowledge and sign for this acceptable user policy during account creation processes. It's a fundamental key policy. It defines how users should protect information under their ownership. Now also, there's a, there's a nice question I've seen before, and it actually caught me out when I was younger. It said, what does the IAB, which is the Internet Advisory Board, see as a major policy violation when using the Internet? Writing viruses, two, hacking, three, resource abuse, and four, reading news groups. The answer there, got your pick. It's resource abuse. So the IAB, what you need to do is read the document, which is really good starting point when you develop your policies and organization. Now also, what is the difference between a custodian and an owner? I think you need to actually look at it and say, listen, if I have a system, I may have different owners and custodians based on different issues. For example, we have a custodian for the backups, a custodian for the system running processes, and then you have a business custodian that owns the data or the processes. Under what circumstances it's fine for users to take information or data home? This will be defined by your information security classification policy and access to information. The elements of acceptable use policy or user access policy is to find the acceptable non-business use of company resources, acceptable use of email and internet web browsing, consequences for non-compliance. Now evaluate this policy statement, and this is a policy statement I found in one of my clients when we actually did one of the investigation. The policy statement is as follows. It says incidental internet access is allowed as long as it is outside company working hours. It sounds okay. However, in this investigation, one of the administrators were guilty of downloading the videos and copying it to DVDs and CDs, as I mentioned in the first section. And he was charged by, on the charge sheet, defining that he's using incidental internet access during working hours. 
his defense, his representation in the union, or you can call him a, a lawyer, his defense was, did you review the other administrators? That's what I was asked in cross-examination. And we said, yes. And he said, did they actually do internet banking? And I said, yes. And he says, I want them fired as well, because they did personal work during office hours. So read carefully and make sure that the policies don't have these loopholes. Should external mail such as webmail programs be allowed in an organization? I usually say no, because uh, this is the biggest leakage environment with data leakage in your enterprise. Can we monitor user activity and email contents? It depends from country to country, legal activity requirements here. In South Africa, the computer uh, regulation for interception of communication and computer related information states that we are allowed to use, uh, monitor users via implicit consent, meaning that if we tell the user he's going to be monitored and he doesn't complain about that, we can go ahead and monitor. Remote access policy is really important because it will define an acceptable method of remotely connecting to the internal network. It's really essential in large disparate corporate networks. It should cover all available methods for connecting remotely, for example, dialing, ISDN, Telnet, Secure Shell, and your digital subscriber line, ADSL. Now also, define a short policy around the auditing and monitoring of remote access logs. Now remote access logs, as you see, it needs additional requirements. So go around that, try to develop your own policy to look at remote access logs for your organization. How long should be these logs be kept in the archive? Again, legal requirements. It is log retention or information retention that you have to consider. Also define a guideline on remote access for the development of a multi-level access methodology, meaning that if a user logs in with his normal user ID and password, um, he has access to webmail, for example, or email, etc. However, if he logs in with a privileged account, he's got access to the full network, network capability, no stopping him because he has to do technical support. Develop a guideline on that. Now, when we look at the remote access security policy, it should define who can have the remote access. The, the methods for remote access, what can, what should be only allowed. Additional restriction on the information. Additional authentication requirements. Additional auditing, logging and monitoring. Access to information and acceptable use policy acknowledged. Because if the user doesn't acknowledge that, he can't have remote access. Does your organization have remote access? Does it have a last log on banner? Look at that. Is there a security banner to define um, that who's allowed and that's only allowed for business? Is there any disclaimers and do you know that? Document those. Define any key policies that may revoke remote access if rejected. For example, access to information, acceptable use. If the user doesn't accept those policies, he can't have remote access. Do you have one more, more than one remote access solution in your organization and how should that be managed? Looking at different solutions, logs, can you collate them together and actually have security review them often. Now, information protection policy provides the information to users on protection of sensitive information. For example, the movement of information to and from inside and outside the organization, storage, backups, electronic transmission. The objective of this policy is to ensure the confidentiality, the integrity and the availability of the information. A new employee is to sign as part of the induction process. Define the induction program in your organization. Did you do it? Did they actually identify the security policies and did you sign those policies when you started up? How does help desk reset the password and how is that managed? Look at the loopholes there because a company may use a standard password for a reset. For example, company 123 as a standard password. Is the security awareness and training part of the daily program? Is there a proper booster of morale there? Information protection elements, which defines sensitivity labels, a need to know access to information. There's non-disclosure agreements, encryption requirements based on the security classification of the information, system classification, default system and file access configuration, and also shredding physical and logical shredding of information. If information is defined as secret and the policy requirements recommend encryption, should the backup always be also be encrypted? Very good question. 
The Department of Defense Orange Book defines a trusted computing base. Do you have systems with classification levels in the organization? For example, is my salary, the, the, my, my payroll system, is that defined as secret and is there additional security requirements? And have you done a trusted path analysis? If you have data that actually goes from one system to the other, can that data be trusted as it landed? So if the one system is secret and the other one's confidential, can you trust that data or will it be become public knowledge suddenly? Also, if you are Sarbanes-Oxley, SOX um, requirement in your organization, all data that actually gives input to the financial reporting has to be trusted. Have a look at that. Perimeter security policy that is physical and logical, physical from doors we get into and logical wireless access extends a perimeter. It defines a responsibility and this will be information security department. It defines a change control process and management of those controls. For example, if I have a wireless access point in an organization, uh, who set it up, uh, how was it accessed, any change control, password management and so on. Also, have a look at your company access card. Does it have a company logo? The problem there might be if you drop it and you fall it, somebody might use a card. Oh, it's from company XYZ. Let's try and get in there. Many companies from a security consideration, what we see is blank cards. Or a card say, listen, if this card was found, please phone this number or report it to a central point and not the company name. Does your company have a change advisory board for all changes to take place? Because policy is really important on this, to define those and describe your logical network perimeter. If you can understand your logical security perimeter in your organization, speak to information security, you need to design those policies and it should actually make sure that it's controlled properly. The elements of a perimeter security, it defines you can have access to the perimeter security systems. It definitely includes procedures to request a perimeter device configuration change and the process that approval. There I'm thinking about wireless access points. It should contain a birth date for a perimeter device system configuration, meaning that if it was installed today, we will review it in 30 days, 60 or 90 days to make sure it's still required, to make sure everything is still fine. A password policy is really important because a password policy defines password construction identification and authentication processes in the organization. It defines accountability if you share that password, what can go wrong and what is the result for non-compliance. Second level and third level authentication to make sure if the user logs into root, for example, on the Unix system, he can only log in as himself and then SU or set user ID to root so that he can be monitored. Password lifetime, meaning how often should password be changed. And I always say it depends because it depends on the security classification of the information. Hardware and pass, hardware tokens and passphrases. And also technology dependent, for example, since SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol. We've got TACAX plus Radius, also diameters, anyone. You need to look at how it is controlled from a router point of view. How often do you change your password? It depends. Um, 30 days normally a good practice. Uh, I've seen some of the banks going to a 90 day process. How long is the password? Because password, um, to crack a password is very easy these days. And as I mentioned before, have a look at your help desk use standard passwords when a user is created or a password is changed. You can actually try to automate your policy distribution via policy servers. Define a, for example, a wiki server or a content management server in your organization where users have got access to and do a complete pass, uh, policy uh, documentation process inside this. It will tell the users all the updates and so on so that everybody will know where to go. If you have a breach in the organization, they can never say, well, I don't know what to do, where to go. When do we develop a policy? To me, often if a small organization starts, they don't have policies. And as soon as things go wrong, they realize, hey, we have to put policies in control. It has to be part of a systems development life cycle. So let's actually look at the start process. Also, when a breach is discovered, they say, oh, we have to make sure that policies in the future will cover this. When a company matures, to me, policies is a great indication of the maturity status of a company. Number of policies, we look at a framework, the length of each policy is important. It should be a living document. It should be updated all the time. We can look at a table of contents and also prioritizing the development. So we look at the framework there. 
Where should all these policies be kept? How are versioning controlled? How, how is the versioning controlled throughout the organization? If we've got a new version of the policy, have you got what has changed, what's updated, and so on? If a policy is updated, are users required to sign the policy for the change? How can we enforce this? The process that we'll have to go through is to say, there's the change, have a review period of 30 days. People are unhappy, let's discuss that. If nobody's unhappy anymore, let's actually make it a policy. Now, when we're going to look at the next section of developing a policy, we need to look at the objectives. Why are we doing it? Operational issues, the scope, who's going to be covered, what's going to be non-compliance, and we're going to give you templates on certain of these aspects. Disclaimers, requirements for those disclaimers, best practices, commercial products, uh, what we can use inside the organization to ensure this, competent disclaimers for users working. Sometimes it might be a person working um, in an environment and you'd like to move the liability up to the user. For example, let me give you a competent disclaimer. You know, if, if you actually walk into a parking garage and it says, they don't take any responsibility for fire and theft and so on. That is all to do with a disclaimer, but it can be, if it can be shown that the parking garage were negligent, it will allow you to actually take, sue them for that. So you must make sure that all your disclaimers covers everything. Also using external consultants, what they have to do and what type of access they have to have in data. And the next thing, we'll look at a framework in the next section of how to start and then develop your own policies. In this final section, we'll look at some policy types and the framework to develop these things. Governments, legal requirements, corporate governance. This will force you to actually develop certain policies. Technical policies as such as system behavior and technical users to control the users with more access than you comfortable with and then finally the end users which should modify the behavior at the end of the day now this is a nice to have little organigram from a security policy statement it's available as a download from the website you get one of these that you want to look at as you can see we've got the information security management system which should be the iso 27000 series now bcp drp security management and then also you can see from the security infrastructure we have policies standards guidelines and procedures so have a look at that and see how your organization fits into that now this is a type of framework it is an excel spreadsheet that's available to download and as you can see there we have got what COBIT requires iso um, ITIL and the company and i would recommend usually to the guys for example, you'll see there that point 13, line 13 says asset classification and control. In this framework, what you'll do is start documenting, do we have it? And if we have a policy, a standards and procedure, document each name of the document in that um, cell of the system. And you can actually look at, see where you are lacking. Then also, once you've done all those, here's a hierarchy of those policies, when it was issued, when it was updated, do when the user reject this is it really a critical issue for certain aspects classification high medium or low or secret whatever you use review frequency or often should we review this policy and a refresh frequency for example if it's the acceptable use policy do we send it to the users every 90 days or we don't at all so when we actually look at quickly a section for the development of policies and what we're going to look at a certain section here is using detailed development focusing on password and user id construction so here we have logical security as point one under that we'll have software security that controls the logical security system access control password management and password and user id construction so you can actually see you can actually break it down into multiple areas so let's look at passwords quickly we should define a minimum password length difficult to guess so no dictionary cyclical passwords should be avoided for example january 04 february 04 month year or anything like that password history to make sure the user can't use the same password over and over again password complexity means that we'll have um, uppercase lowercase numerical and special characters 
and also a seed for system generated passwords. This is where it becomes a little bit complex because if you have users to develop password generating systems, you must make sure that it always it doesn't generate the same password over and over again or the probability of finding a certain password is very high. Also, it can be pronounceable system generated password. When the guys develop technical, the memory should be cleared of password. Protection of password generation algorithms. This is once again so no hackers can get in your system and predict what passwords will be given. And anonymous user IDs. Um, you can use that without any passwords, lock it down, very limited access. So if you do use that, define it in your password policy of what should and how should it be handled. A password system interface for displaying and printing of passwords. Should it be controlled, uh, for example, if you want to print a password list, should be done from a certain workstation and printer only, and should that be audited. A periodic forced password change, how often should a user change its passwords, for example, every 30 days. Assignment of expired password, this is, I would create a standard password for a user, he will or she will have to change that password as soon as they log in. Limit consecutive unsuccessful attempts. Well, I've seen most organizations use three unsuccessful attempts before it lock a password out. Some of the good practices I have seen is instead of three, rather five, because a hacker statistically will not break a password in three or five. Very similar to statistical probability. However, a user who has forgotten his password will remember most probably in five then three, and that will actually lower your administration cost. Single sign-on process, how does it work? Workstation boot password, depending on the secure environment. As you can see, all these things have to be designed inside a password policy. Password protected outside secure storage area, how must that be done? Fixed password changes to be confirmed by mail, and if it's done by mail, the password shouldn't be in the mail. Part protection of passwords sent through the mail, how should that be done? Re-registration required for all users for getting fixed passwords. Now this fixed password, what it defines is the password that you log on to the system. So it won't change every time, so it's a fixed password. One of the clients I actually looked at, what they've required is if you forget your password, you have to go through a whole process of getting access and have all managers sign a form again like you will do it as the first day you started working there. And this sort of like forces the users tend to get a password remembrance process so they can actually uh, you don't make it easy for them to actually hey just change my password kind of thing storage of passwords and readable formats policy should cover that to make sure are we using it should be using it as well then also from an internal design if you write any applications that do store password the password should be encrypted we're using a one-way hash Incorporating of passwords in software. Some software has been found to define, have hard-coded passwords. A few years ago, um, Interbase, which was a product bought by Borland from Ashton Tate, their SQL server had a hard-coded password in the SQL server and it was only found out when users got access to the source code when it was open sourced and it was called Firebird. Now, the password, uh, the user ID was political and the password was correct. Now, this is a problem because then every version before 604 of the SQL Server, hard coded password was in and it creates a real problem. Prevention of password retrieval. Um, you'd rather reset a user's password instead of retrieving because somebody else can retrieve that. Reliance on the operating system, user authentication process. When you actually have that, understand how secure it is and where the weaknesses are. Access control with individualized passwords, so you don't have shared passwords, and unique password for each internal network device. Difficult to manage, but it can be done, um, whereby if one user found, a hacker, for example, finds a user ID and a password for a router, and he the same password is used for switches and routers all over, it is a huge problem. Huge of duress passwords, meaning that a system can be set up. So if a user is under duress, has a gun to their head, he puts in a special password, 
and that password will take him into a dummy system and you can actually follow up on that. This is for high secure environment, changing vendor default passwords. For example, default password for 3Com devices, security admin and manager has the password, same as the user ID for those three. It has to be changed. Now, user responsibility for passwords, we look at that. There's different passwords on different systems. If you synchronize those passwords, it may be have a problem. Permission to use the same password on different systems. Suspected disclosure forces password changes. You need to go through a process for health desk looking at that. Password change after compromise of the system. Difficult. If the system has been compromised, you usually say rebuild because you cannot trust it in anymore. Writing passwords down should be prohibited. If you want to write it down, it should be cryptic, of course. Dynamic token must not be stored with a laptop. Writing down of passwords should be encoded. I said that earlier. Password sharing should be prohibited. User accountable for all activities under the user ID. If you can get this into the user's thought process that if I share my password and anybody does something on my user ID, I am responsible, they'll tend to not share those. Force change of all passwords. In-person proof of identity when a user gets there. Not just a phone call coming up. Password disclosure by administrators. When an pa administrator resets a password, a user should be forced to change his or her password on the first sign-on. And this is because some administrators may use that user ID and password to actually download uh, software that they're not allowed to download. And during the logon process, positive identification required for system usage. Access control on remote access systems. This is really important. And again, consider this in your policy for uh, specialized monitoring and auditing on remote access. User ID and password required for computer connected network access all the time. Shouldn't just have open access. A unique user ID and password. Never should passwords and user IDs be shared. Disclosure of incorrect login information. And also the feedback after incorrect login information. Now, what, what this means is that sometimes you log into a system, you put the user ID and a password, the system shouldn't tell you, listen, hey, incorrect password. It should, because now you can actually know the user ID is correct, but I can try different passwords. It should say user ID and password combination is incorrect. So the user can never try and guess that. Security notice in a system login banner. Part of your organization, it should tell the user when last it was logged on, what the system is secured for, and authorized access. Disclosure of information, a system login banner, this should be removed. So if you log into a system, it shouldn't tell you this is, you know, Microsoft Exchange 5.5. Then a hacker would know, hey, I can actually do a denial of service attack on that server because it's an old server. Network login banner, authorized access only. Notice of last login date and time. I really like this because I always check if I log on to my internet banking when last somebody logged in and I don't know if it was me or not. Limitation of number of logins, cut off day, cut off amount of time, and also the limit of concurrent logins into the network. This is a possibility. Leaving sensitive systems without logging off, it should be covered in your password policy. Logging off personnel computers connect to the network and this should be logged to a centralized server so we can actually look at all the logs. Privilege control, use of systems. An example we could go through here, content of the policy should be like, for example, games may not be stored and used on company XYZ computers. Personal use of computers and communication systems. Cover that because it's impossible to say to a user you're not allowed to use it because there is a fair use clause in the constitution. Incidental personal use of business systems is permissible, but it shouldn't be an abuse. Internet for personal use should be prohibited. Um, one of the systems for access control um, web sense, um, if I may mention a product here, it has got the facility that if you log on to the internet from your company and it sees it's not a business related site, it will ask you that you have 20 minutes for personal usage. Would you like to use some of that time now to visit that site? And it makes the user consider and think as well if they are wasting company resources. Personal use of internet only on personal time. Then permissible use of company XYZ information. This is really critical from access to information, disclosure of information. Personal time use and prohibited activities. This should be use of systems but normally covered under the acceptable use policy. Granting of user IDs to outsiders. 
a definite no-no, never sharing those, and it should be covered in some of your policies. Third-party access to company XYZ systems requires a signed contract. You must make sure there's a service level agreement. Information systems access privilege terminate when works that workers leave. And this is not workers on leave, but when workers actually leave your employment, you should make sure that that user IDs are disabled. Disclaimer of responsibility to damage to data and programs. The user should know that they are responsible for their actions. Gaining unauthorized access via company XYZ information systems. User, um, one of the cases um, I've, I've heard of is that a user got away with hacking or unauthorized access because he said the system said to him, welcome. Now, when we look at finding the policy design process, you should have an objective. Why are we doing this? Background, why is this policy created? Scope, who's covered? The audience that will actually have to review it. The actual policy statement, normally very small and to the point. The definition of certain keywords, if it's required. Any related policies and other supportive documentation like standards and procedures. And it's sometimes nice to start and use the ISO 9000 requirement. We'll have inputs, a process and outputs. So from a policy point of view, you can look at that. Enforcement, how it will be enforced, who will authorize that policy when it's been approved, documentation control, any updates, any proposed amendments, how will that go through the process. Now this concludes this first uh, section. There will be examples further on and uh, practices to develop your own policies. If you have any questions, define a header, for example, from policy development and send it to info at sacs.co.za and we'll gladly get into a dialogue with you.